Hello and welcome to the Folk Music Podcast. My name is Anders and in this episode of the show I'm speaking with Scottish fiddler Lauren McCall. Now, Lauren has recently released an album called Landskin that I have totally fallen in love with. So I'm really happy that she um, agreed to come on the show and talk about the album. Now, we have a lovely chat um, talking about things like uh, the process of making her album um, and uh, just what it means to be a musician and an artist, really, especially in times like this. So, um, yeah, I'm going to try to keep this intro fairly short. Uh, as you'll notice, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see that I'm not in my usual recording studio. I'm actually out on my porch recording this, trying to get it done before the sun goes down. Um, and the reason for this is that my house is just a total mess <laughs> at the moment because of a major renovation project that kind of started with the kitchen, but turns out we're just redoing the whole house now. So yeah, it's a big, big total mess, but I'm looking forward to everything is done so I can have my studio back. <laughs> But enough about my personal life. Let's get into the uh, episode with Lauren McCall. Okay, so I'm here with uh, Lauren McCall. Thanks for coming on the show. Hi, nice to hear you. So uh, I'm really happy that uh, you could join me for this episode because um, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, I've been aware of you for a while now because, uh, well, several reasons, but uh, I'm a good friend with one of your former bandmates, Saturday and Summers. Um, oh, whom you yeah. used to play in, or you still play in the band Rant but she also used to be in that band um, great band by the way uh, but I've also enjoyed your solo releases um, I think they're all very solid but I especially enjoy this latest album that you put out called uh, Landskin um, I think that release kind of takes it to a different space uh, and I, I really liked how that album has kind of a naked, introspective vibe, perhaps. Or at least that's how I interpret mm. it. Uh, and I'd love to hear yeah. um, kind of your thoughts on it and your story behind it and maybe the process of making it, all that stuff. Yeah, it's it's really intriguing that, that you... I'm, I'm so glad that that's connected with you on that level because that's definitely what I, what I set out to do. And it's perhaps a perhaps an album that I've been wanting to do for a very long time, mm. but had never felt ready to do it. No. Um, the material was perhaps ready. Um, a lot of the tunes I've been carrying with me for 10, 15 years. Um, so it's, it's not a collection of music that I've just discovered and it's all old material. Mm. But I think I just, I've reached a stage in life where I felt comfortable releasing an album of, yeah. predom it's predominantly very slow, slow airs. Yeah, I, I think I know what you mean, because it's it's a very mature sound in a way to the, uh, but we can go, come back to all that. But before we jump in, maybe you could um, quickly introduce yourself and tell us a bit about who you are and your musical background and perhaps how that ties yeah. into where you are today with this album and everything. So I'm from the Highlands of Scotland. I'm from uh, the Black Isle, which is just north of Inverness. It's a peninsula. It's not an island. Um, and I grew up learning music through school and um, through violin lessons at school, but also um, at a, through an organisation called Faish Roche. And Faish in Scottish Gaelic means festival. Um, so literally it means festival of Rosshire, which is the area that I grew up in. And I suppose these are summer schools um, teaching kids and in fact people of all ages to, to, to play and become connected to the music and the language from their area and to feel proud of that. Um, so that organisation has been going for 30 years and that's very much where I, I learnt my traditional music through that organisation and, and now I teach for them, which is a lovely thing to, to come full circle of. Nice. Um, so learnt learnt through them until I moved to Glasgow when I was 17 to study music at the Royal Conservatoire. And stayed in Glasgow for a number of years after that. And that would be and traditional music uh, at the conservatory? It was, yeah, traditional music. So when I was there, the degree was actually, it was a Bachelor of Arts in Scottish music. Um, and that, that course has widened a little bit since, um, but it was very much focused on, on Scottish traditional music. Mm. Which... Um, 
yeah, that I mean, the course is still young in in a sense. It was how, how long has it been, been around the the folk music course? I think the late nineties, so perhaps ninety eight, ninety nine. Oh, really? I wouldn't like to be hmm. certain about that, but it's 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 relatively new in terms of a degree. And that was the first kind of place you could take a degree in in traditional music in in, in Scotland. Yep. Oh. Yes. Um, and after that course, developed the the folk music degree in Newcastle University in England. It developed pretty soon after mm. that. Um, and and the two have become the kind of the go to places. Yeah. Um, to study uh, along with the new degree, which is now in the University of the Highlands and Islands, um, which is 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 based in the Outer Hebrides and is hugely popular as well. Um, so there's there's plenty places to study now. Yeah. Um, but for me, Glasgow was the choice. It was a, a really, th- I suppose the course was was one element, but the music scene there and the session scene and. What was going? What was going on in kind of the early two thousands was uh, was very vibrant. Yeah, and that's usually the most impo- of, most uh, important thing, isn't it? When you go to study, like uh, for me, yeah. when I went to conservatory studying jazz, like the main thing was never the teachers or the school or anything. It's just the, the environment, the other, meeting other other students, other like minded people. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and Glasgow had all of that and. It's a really interesting place, Glasgow, as a well. It's an, I find it a fascinating city just with its with its history. It's a it's a very working class city, and I think that that brings with it a just a real the the people there, the characters there, they're they're so warm and mm. and vibrant and 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 just welcome you in. So as a Highlander moving to that city, I just found it um, a great place to to kind of. Um, find my adulthood if you yeah. like um but that kind of melting point um the melting pot rather of of music there's so much irish heritage in in glasgow that i couldn't believe it when i sat well sat at the back of my first session when i moved and i didn't know a single tune no um, because they were it was irish, all, it was irish, all tunes. irish music yeah yeah and and that 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 blew my mind because as a Highlander, I didn't grow up with that music at no. all. I was definitely listening to those bands, um, but I hadn't made the connection that that music was was in Scotland. No. Um, so it was a massive learning curve. But would, um, would you say for me uh, being in Glasgow? Do you think that has changed? Is it more Scottish tunes these days? In I think I think it has. There's still a a a, a big Irish. Um, kind of second third generation Irish community so there's still that strand to it and a lot of teaching goes on that's that's still Irish music based so but I I guess since the conservatoire has established and the student population has established there people are coming from all sorts of backgrounds and yeah um I'm just I would ask, say I'm just, I'm just asking because mix mix a lot more okay yeah yeah I can imagine yeah I'm just asking because I feel like I see and hear a lot more Scottish music these days than maybe I used to do 10 years ago. Or maybe I'm just looking more. I don't know. seems like uh, a lot is going on in the Scottish scene. It's it's a amazing scene for for the kind of... And a lot of young musicians as well. A, yes, and, and it's always been very progressive. I think all the the, the older musical community have always been very supportive of progression within the scene mm. um and that i suppose that comes with its pros and cons um, <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> but it's it's it, i've always had the encouragement of from older musicians that um you know it's never been like you must do this a certain way it, it there's there's been always room for experiment which is um Oh, I'm not. I'm not a hugely experimental musician, um, as far as that goes. But I, I think my peers and my colleagues feel that they have a an an open mm. an open space in order to do that if they wish, which is a is a lovely scene to be part mm. of. Great. So, how long did you stay in Glasgow for then? I think I ended up there for almost ten years, um, and. Yeah, I still have a fondness for that city, but um, I was always keen to to move back. So I've ever since then I've been making my way back. I was then about an hour north of Glasgow, and 
Okay. In two hours north, <laughs> okay. and, and now I'm nearly, kind of nearly home, and I'm I'm fairly uh-huh. settled just south of Inverness again. So. Cool. And uh, yeah, yeah, I have a kind of a similar experience like you. Like I'm from a very very small place out in the countryside, and I went to well various cities to study music, and I spent a good ten years in those cities. But now I'm kind of back <laughs> where I grew up, and it's it's a great feeling actually. It's uh it's 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 like you, it's kind of you you appreciate your roots a lot more when you've been mm. around a bit if you know what i mean <laughs> yeah it gives you a different perspective mm. um especially if i think whatever you grow up with you could grow up i think at the base of mount everest and not think anything no, of it because it's, exactly. it's 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 on your doorstep mm. and and then when you return to the thing and and realize with with a little bit more maturity what what the value of that is exactly um is yeah it's a special thing and i i think that all has contributed to this new album for me in yeah. that i've i've perhaps these tunes that i've loved for so long these really old melodies have have started to realize how important they are to me as a person um and maybe i feel more able to communicate that to others now um through through this recording mm. so it's it's an interesting process yeah cool so um let's talk about um this album then um land skin so how long has it been out now a couple of months something like that yeah it came out came out in august yeah, great. and um oh what a weird time to release music eh? <laughs> so, what, what can you do but but i i I actually feel that it's been a great time for this album to come out because it was never, it was never going to be an album that I was going to tour a lot. There were going to be perhaps a handful of gigs. Um, but it, it's an album for me that I want people to put on like with a fire on Mm. when they've got, you know, put it on in nice speakers, get a nice whiskey or something and just, and immerse (laughs) themselves in it yeah. and and people have got more more time to do that at the moment than, than perhaps their fast paced life before because like I, I saw um, you put, putting out this this new album uh, and I tried to just listen to a couple of the tracks while on the go or something and I really realized that like you said this isn't the kind of album you should listen to bits and pieces here and there so I kind of had to sit mm. down with it and listen to the whole thing from start to finish um, because as you said it's almost only slow tunes or or airs, traditional slow. C- can you just maybe explain what is an air exactly? So I, th- I think I would categorize an air as a melody that has come from a song. So a, vo- a vocal air um, or a, a slow air in our Scottish tradition is, um, I suppose, the slowest form of music. It doesn't necessarily have a meter or a pulse no. um it can be quite quite free um but the majority the majority of these airs that i play on this album have once been vocal melodies mm. and do you know uh the, the lyrics of, of the tunes that you're, that you're playing some of them i do i'm i'm not a singer um but but others have been lost and and that that's a small criticism i suppose of some of these collectors of music was that they were very keen to get these melodies down, but not so keen um, on the words. And that uh, there were various reasons for that. Um, some some political and some because of the... So so some of the words that were, were being sung, I mean, some of these airs are from the kind of post culloden post um, the kind of Jacobite times where there were many things being said that people were keen to hush hush um and so removing those words from the melodies was the the way of doing that but it was at a time where the so some of these collections are perhaps from the early 1800s when it was becoming fashionable to publish music and and to have it in in printed form for for the big country houses and the the patrons of music to to play on their harpsichord mm. um, in the drawing room. Um, so, al- so al- already, ju- already at the po- at that point, it was primarily an instrumental, uh, non non vocal tradition or non lyrical tradition. Yes, yeah. 
Okay, that's yes. interesting. And especially, especially from these tunes, which were they were being taken from the Highlands, where the the music was predominantly Gaelic song and piping and fiddles, um, but they were being presented to these publishers in in Glasgow or, or in the cities, so that they could take them and present them to the. Um, to the upper classes, exactly, um, and that was really the only way to to monetize from their from their collections was to publish them. Hmm. Um, so I've I've kind of removed that element of it and and tried to go back to the tunes as I would perhaps hear somebody singing them, um, and to give them a a voice through my fiddle again, because um, a lot of these tunes are some of them are quite well known, but the majority are are not that often played. No. Um, and I find like I've been playing various types of Celtic traditional music myself for a good ten years, uh, but I don't think I can play a s- slow air uh, in any convincing way at all. Uh, more maybe mostly because that is has never been my focus. But as as we alluded to earlier, it takes a certain kind of maturity to approach a melody like that because there are so few notes, mm-hmm. so there aren't really that much to hide behind. And I mean, if, if you're blasting out the reel, you can kind of get away with it not being the most, uh, I don't know, interesting thing in the world just because it's it's fast and it's exciting. But when you play uh, a slow air like this, like the, the music you have on your on your album, you have to really be present in the music, I think, uh, yes, in, in a way yeah. that kind of it... takes, um, I don't know, it takes a certain maturity, I suppose, to get underneath the skin of the tune. Yeah, I think there's a certain yeah, like like you're describing this kind of almost embodiment of the melody, um, which for me is it is like my my singing, my my kind of voice through how I how I kind of breathe with the melody is I, I breathe a lot in in my playing, mm. um, but you're right, the slow the slow air is the form of perhaps especially on the fiddle because the bow is so unforgiving if you're nervous or if you're if you lack tone or variety of expression um the bow will soon expose that so um i grew up loving slow music and i think that's that's really helped so it's not something that i've had to kind of approach and try it's, that sounds a bit um, cocky to say I haven't had to work at it. I, I no, certainly but I, have worked I, I at it, I but I've, mean, yeah. I've always loved it. So I think mm. that's really helped. Yeah, because I've always been a kind of musician. I've always been attracted to the like the, the technical stuff, the fast stuff. All that, when I listen to my playing from years back, it's always like a bit faster than I can actually manage and like a bit too technical and all that stuff. But in recent years, I've come to like really appreciate more and more sim- simple stuff uh, not not simple in, in that way but uh, more minimalistic yeah, in know, a way yeah. um, so yeah I, I really enjoyed listening think, to your I think there's album. room there's room for both isn't there and definitely I you know I I, I notice how much um, you know th- this music and, and, and the slow airs because because they are a lot of them are so free and they have no pulse that was that was it was quite easy to decide that a lot of it would work best unaccompanied yeah um because that that's and, another point like and there's, I did have... there's almost no other instruments on the album it's pretty much only you throughout there's there's piano on two or three tracks perhaps yes yeah, yeah. and um and that was just on a few that I could really hear those colors but um I think to to use to use my solo project to have that voice is that fulfills me for that and then I really enjoy the more slightly technical and um the faster stuff with others mm. where you're really sparking off somebody else's energy. Exactly. Um I find find playing faster stuff on my own unaccompanied is not something I enjoy as much because I really I really feed off the rhythms of of other players. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. But um so these uh, tunes on this album, is it all music that you've uh, that you've had with you for a long time, or did you do some digging or some kind of uh, is some of the tunes newer uh, tunes on your repertoire? 
a little bit of a mix, maybe three quarters I've had for, for quite a long mm. time. And I noticed when I decided to make it last year that there was a little bit of a theme emerging in that a couple of the titles were related to, to mountains or hills. Um, and that wasn't a conscious thing, but it it's it made me realise how much I'm a, I am kind of attracted to music off off the landscape mm. and and hill walking has become a very important thing in my life over the last six or seven years and um, it's been a bit of a a, a discovery um that it, it really makes me tick and it's a real antidote to the traveling and the touring and the and the computer screens yeah. so i suppose that all it all tied together in my head and made me realize that you know, it's not a concept album, but it, it it that gave me a thread to work on. So um, when I was looking for the final kind of piece in the puzzle, the last track, um, which then became the opening track, I was looking through this old collection of tunes, um, which is quite local to me, um, collected by a man called Simon Fraser, um, who was from only about 10 miles away. And his his tunes have, have been recorded by lots of people, but there's a few gems in there. And um, I came across this one tune um, called Ermulach Banuavish, and that means on top of Ben Wivis. And Ben Wivis is the the highest mountain um, that I've I've grown up looking at for my my childhood. It's it's just north of Inverness, mm. and it's a very very dark looming hill. It really looms over the whole area. Um, so, so that immediately, I, I was glad then when I had a little play through it that it was a, a really beautiful melody. Yeah. <laughs> because quite often it's the tune title that attracts you, and then you play, you get a few bars in, you think, oh, yeah, no. yeah, that's, <laughs> that's not great. <laughs> that's um, funny. <laughs> but with, with with that one, I was um, I was very very happy to find mm. it to, to find such a gorgeous local local melody. Um, so that that then kind of became like the single from the from the album um and and there are most of them are from books i love learning tunes from manuscripts um because i know that i won't have heard anybody else play it no. so i know that my reading of it is is the only thing that's that's in my brain whereas i think my ear just the minute i hear somebody else's version i really struggle to get away from that mm. What, what, um, about our, 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 what about point. archive recordings? Is that something you've been using as source material? Yeah, not not so much for this album. I have before. Um, and I because guess... that's a different thing as well, isn't it? From yeah, learning from yeah, I mean, uh, notation. Yeah, I, lo I love it. And I do, I love hearing a, a kind of a much older version of something and in, in that interpretation. But I do find it then very difficult to get away from that as the, like even tempo, mm. you know, like if you hear somebody playing something, I, I've got, I don't know why, but I've got this thing about speed. And once I've heard somebody play something at a certain speed, yeah. it's ingrained in me and I find it very difficult to take it, take it into another yeah. zone. So hence why I love playing through these old books and, um, and knowing that I'll, it's it's just my interpretation of those mm. notes cool you're kind of at the mercy of the person who wrote it down i suppose but <laughs> yeah yeah well that's it and I, and i i do take things with a little bit of a pinch of yeah. salt because going back to that thing about the collections as well one one thing that that we do know and it's been well documented is that the people who published them quite often make, made them a bit more complicated because they were perceived to be too simple. Okay, yeah. Um, mm. So quite often, like, you, you know, things that were just modal, they'll have added in the sharpened seven, they'll have made it sound more strictly in the major or minor Yeah, because scale. they had an, an image in their head of how this was supposed to sound. So they kind of, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Like um, we had a lot of similar so, things in Norway where like, some of the the earliest people to to kind of collect traditional music was like schooled musicians who who, who knew how to write sheet music like uh, a lot of organ players uh, f from the local church they would mm. like gather in some or um, write down some local tunes but they didn't necessarily understand the rhythm or the embellishments so so they kind of simplify them or they um, they put their own spin on, on them if you know uh, in a way 
But uh, but as yeah. I say, you kind of just have to uh, remember that you're looking at an old tune through the pen of the person who actually brought it down, which can be an interesting yes. experience as well, I suppose. Yeah, and, it, and almost, I suppose, especially when a lot of these tunes were taken from singers. So um, Captain Simon Fraser, who I just mentioned, nearly all of the melodies that he wrote down were from the singing of somebody and therefore some of the keys are they're pretty tricky like three or four flats um which wouldn't sit naturally on the fiddle no. um and so it's just thinking well was that the key that person was singing in or how you know what what was the con the context of mm. the collection and and also i i've come to think re recently about all these collections that they're so they're so important to us that we have them, and um, some of them being three, three hundred and fifty years old. There's, they're so important, but at the same time, I, as a musician and somebody who writes down music, cannot imagine in three hundred years somebody analysing every detail of what I have put to paper. Um, so I always try and think and put myself in that person's shoes and think. If they were scribbling down a tune to give to their bandmates and for a yeah. for a dance, and bef you know <laughs> it, it ended up in this book that we're all yeah. we're all scutinizing three hundred yeah. years later. Yeah, it's a bit comical. It's like trying trying to put things into context mm. and think that they were never ever meant to be these hugely academic pieces of work, and and that's not to belittle them at all because they were skilled musicians, but. Um, yeah, to just to always take it with a pinch of salt, I suppose. Yeah, like yeah, they couldn't imagine what, as you say, like what would happen with that <laughs> scrib scribble yeah. two hundred years later. Like in 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 Norway, yeah. we have a lot of uh, recording of like old fiddlers um, in the thirties and in the fifties, where people would like just show up at their doorstep with a tape recorder and hey, play some old tunes. Uh, yeah, and like whatever they. <laughs> they play that that day is like just now set in stone and that's the gospel everyone has yeah. that's how that's music from the yeah, yeah that's the, yeah. like the that's how music from that valley sounds finish end of story uh but in reality it was just something that person happened to play at that at that time like yeah he couldn't know <laughs> what that would be like used for in the future so that's interesting exactly yeah i think we we have to have to give those people the respect mm. of of imagining that somebody interrupted their day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Literally, <laughs> Whatever they went up to, yeah. to to make that recording, mm. don't we? Um, and yeah, long before we sat sat all day thinking about our music so intensely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, these guys were probably like lumberjacks and farmers and <laughs> they, they didn't imagine like yeah. someone scrutinizing. But anyway, um, could we talk a bit about uh, the production of your album? Because um, uh, you chose... It's not recorded in a, in a recording studio, is it? No, and in fact, I realised the other day that I haven't made a recording in a recording studio for quite some time now. Um, so this, this album was recorded in a place called um, Abriachen Hall, and Abriachen is is on Loch Ness side, um. So the our our most famous body of water beside Inverness, um. So the 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 little hall, which is a little kind of tin hall, very small, um. It's up the top of this very steep hill, and I went to see some concerts there, when I was a teenager, and they were it was unaccompanied fiddle playing, um, and in particular the playing of Liz Doherty, the great okay. Irish fiddle mm. player. Um, I heard her there when I was fifteen, and I just remember thinking, "Wow, this fiddle sounds so great in this hall." Um, so that that stuck with me, and when I realised I wanted to make this album, I I just thought it, this music doesn't suit a studio in a sense. It needs a context and a space. Mm. Um, and and for the fiddle to just sing in that hall. So there's very, very, very little, 
I think there's only on one track is there a tiny little bit of artificial reverb. Okay. Um, mm. And the rest is just the sound of the room. So I was quite keen to transport all the listeners to to that little Highland Hall and to hear the, the warmth of sound in that room. Mm. So I did that with my good friend Barry Reed too. He used to play guitar with me um, on my first couple of records and he's um, trained to be a great sound engineer and really enjoys these kind of remote recordings. Um, he recorded my previous album, which is called The Seer as well. Um, and he's just, he's great. He he knew he knew what I wanted to achieve, but he also knows the sound of my fiddle. He really knows what what elements of that that I want to, to come out in a recording. So he, yeah, he, he sat in the kitchen of the hall for four days and um, it was freezing. I, I remember that. Okay, about okay. <laughs> that was like my lasting memory was just turning up in hats and gloves and yeah, that's... putting like pound coins <laughs> in an electricity meter to try and get it to work. So at, at what, what time of year did you record it? It was in November. Okay. <laughs> um, which, yeah, it just always kind of crisp i remember crisp mornings leaving the house um and then on on day three we because there's no piano in that hall um we hired a a baby grand piano to to be delivered in the morning and to be taken away at night so we just had this window and um james ross who played piano um who also played in my first um played in my first record um he came up on the early train from glasgow and you know those days where like things just have to work. Mm. <laughs> we had the piano for one day, we had James for one day, and I woke up and there was snow on the ground and like for you guys in Norway, that is no problem. No. But like Scot- Scottish people don't know how to deal with snow at no, all. No, it's I a know. disaster. It's yeah, like a, yeah, yeah. a little bit like that and everything like, just shuts like, down. Like l- last year I was supposed to go to a, a, f- a music festival in um, in a village called Corfin in, in Clare in Ireland and uh, I've been there multiple times before but at this particular uh, this is in when is it March February uh, yeah, sometime around there and uh, they had a little bit of snow but it turned out to be the most the highest amount of snow ever or in the last 30 years or something <laughs> and the whole country went into lockdown completely and like the prime <laughs> minister was out on TV and telling people to like oh, stay home take it be careful like everything was closed <laughs> I'm like it's just I, I understand that when there 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 are no snow plows in the entire country that <laughs> has to happen yeah. but as a Norwegian it was a bit of a funny contrast because yeah well, you know yeah bet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah nevertheless this man um kindly took this piano up this hill in a horse box trailer off on the end of his car and got up the really steep hill and and it was fine and he just put the piano up and quickly tweaked it tuned it and and we just had a day and looking back on it it was a magical day for me because it it all you know when something a plan just comes together and um and the music i think was kind of affected by that we just we just had a few hours to to get those takes done and um and do them obviously totally live in that space um and then before you knew it the the piano was off back down the hill again it's like (laughs) a fairy tale almost (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. But um, yeah, really tasty um, piano playing as well. I think on on those tracks, mm-hmm. it's kind of it, it can be uh, challenging listening to like ten tracks of solo fiddle if you're not super into that tradition. <laughs> yeah. But like, it it really helps having like these few things. There's there are a couple of drones here and there, and and you do mm. some dubbing with the viola, I think, on some tracks. Yes. Um, yeah. So that for, so for, for, for me, that's just are... made the whole thing a bit more approachable. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think, totally unaccompanied fiddle is 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 well. It's still a niche album, I would say, but it's it, it totally unaccompanied. Is it's intense and it it maybe becomes a little bit more um, not not academic work, but a kind of like a documentation rather than a. Um, than, than an album in itself mm. as a as a piece um so the drones are just a couple of we've got a tiny little pump organ um that's 
kind of in tune, <laughs> kind yeah, of in tune but... with itself. <laughs> uh, but I had to had to tune the fiddle to it, mm. um, and that's a nice drone. And then the other drone is a electric guitar. Oh, really? Just threw an amp in the hall on a sustain. Okay. Huh. Um, so we were just we mic'd up the amp and just tried to like capture some of the there's really strange overtones when that when we played that amp really loud in the hall and like yeah I love the sound of that mm. <laughs> and that that again like coming back to using the room as opposed to just adding a bunch of effects to the, to the track. exactly oh. yeah, yeah I really like that yeah. approach um, so I, like I'm not gonna try to pronounce any of the tracks because that would be <laughs> embarrassing but. I think it's like around track seven or eight. There's like a slow tune that goes into a kind of a slow reel feeling. Um, kind of yes, like two different melodies yeah. together. And that was just such a yeah. nice like after because all the the previous tracks have been like very fairly slow, I think, and then mm. all of a sudden this like very kind of a drony reel is played like four times or something with the piano, and it's. Yeah, really nice stuff. Really perfect, like perfect timing um, when it comes to tracks as well. I mean, I'm I'm big big fan mm. of the album as an as an art form. Like the 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 order of the tracks really matters to me. Like when I I'd like to sit down and listen to an album from start to finish and have it all make sense, or at least yes. have an um, have the impression impression that the artist has uh, made a conscious choice of like where to put the different tracks and stuff, which I believe you have on this album yeah I remember it took me a while to decide where to put the ones with piano mm. um, you know not to top load them like like all right at the start or, or do I put them all in a chunk no. or uh, I spaced them out a little bit I think there's kind of two and two um, but with that one I, I, I the one you're speaking about with the, the two tracks so that's two small pieces of Gaelic mouth music. What's um, what's mouth so music? There's, so there's a tradition uh, within Gaelic singing called push to bail, um, which means um, well, it's Gaelic mouth music or the 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 song or the the reel from the mouth, um, and traditionally they're they're reels or jigs or strathspeys or dance tunes, but they would have had words to them, and and quite often those words were. Um, you know, they were tunes that people in in a local place knew the melody, and then they would make words for them. So it could have been local gossip, or um, they were never very serious topics. No, no, I, um, I think I heard something like that, and and but sung in just uh, nonsense words, kind of. Yeah, and a, a lot of the time, the they will have they will the words will have meaning, but the they're very light in 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 topic. Um, and it's it's a it's an amazing um, kind of it's kind of the skill of a, a great Gaelic singer is the articulation on those words when they're singing them fast. So these two little melodies there I picked up from two great singers. The first being Rona Lightfoot, who is oh just an incredibly inspiring woman. She's a piper, um, and she. I believe she was she was one of the first um women pipers to be kind of allowed and respected to to compete in in piping. Um but she um sings this tradition um called cantra which is the um like singing the music off the pipes um, and all the or- ornamentation. It's totally fasc- fascinating to hear. Um but she's she's just a, an amazing woman full of lots of beautiful songs and um so the first one I I heard her sing and the second one I um got from the singing of a great Gaelic singer from Glasgow called Maeve McKinnon who I used to play and tour a little bit with as well um so those those kind of song melodies are are kind of stick in the head quite cool quite a lot Mm. from singers so um so we haven't really spoken about like the the title of the album Lanskine what what does it mean exactly so I came across a tweet um, by the great writer Robert McFarlane, a great nature writer, and he was doing a thing a few years ago, maybe 2017, um, he was doing like a tweet every day, he would have this 
like a unique word and the description of that word all to do with nature. And one day up comes this one, Landskeen, which I hadn't come across before. And he had picked up this word in the Western Isles um, from a local man who gave this as the description of when you look at a, um, a kind of scenery and a horizon, when you see multiple horizons, like multiple mountains, all at different layers, and they look like they're all weaving and braiding, Mm-hmm. And particularly, particularly on a hazy day, where the each horizon gets a little bit more blurred in the background, then that's a land scheme. Oh, really? Huh. So that's, that's that not, word nice, nice to have a word for totally, that. <laughs> <laughs> totally stuck with me. Cool. Um, <laughs> and when yeah, when it then when it came to putting this album together and and all these kind of hill related tunes were um, were emerging, then that seemed like a a nice a nice fit for it mm. um and that kind of tied in then when i um dis- was deciding on the artwork i commissioned my friend myrid green who is an amazing accordion player yeah. as well um but she has recently been doing a lot of art and really getting into her art so i asked her would she mind doing something and i i just gave her the album name and let her hear the tracks and and she came up with these beautiful landscape pen drawings of braiding hill lines mm. um so it was lovely to collaborate she she also lives in the highlands and just you know when you make something so personal mm. and it's very much a solo project to be able to then have some communication with somebody else and and do oh, some yeah. form of collaboration it, yeah. that really helped because that was right at the start of lockdown as well so it was yeah. nice to have that process going on and you you didn't you never had like any ex- producer or any kind in the mix it's just you and the recording engineer uh, yeah mm. yeah it was just us so that that made it even more personal mm. i think um but as you say it's not, it's it's nice think, to bring some other people in the process at some point uh mm. because like i've i've done a couple of albums solo albums and i just get tired of myself after <laughs> after some time like <laughs> please i need someone else's opinion i i, I don't know yeah, if this yeah, is yeah. good or bad so, anymore <laughs> i know yeah and it, i think maybe because so the la- the previous couple of albums i've worked on the recording before that i did um was an album of the band salt house i play with um, an album called who am and we've been working for a couple of years now with producer andy bell um and that when we record that always feels like a very collaborative process and I I really enjoy the process of just sticking the cans on and and getting all the feedback from them saying no try this try yeah. this no not that yeah. not do that you know and having that like lovely thing happening mm. so yeah I mean I'm not gonna lie there was one day when we were recording Landscape that I just was like oh this is quite lonely yeah well <laughs> you know <laughs> um and so, yeah, I can kind of hear that in some, you know, I don't want it to come across as like, I'm a lonely person in a hall up a hill all on my own. <laughs> but at the same time, there's a there's a certain perhaps kind of contentment with that solitude as well. Um, and yeah, being content in one's own space, one's, one's own company and one's own voice, whatever that may be, whether it's a voice or an instrument. Mm, and that's definitely something I took away from the album, like the element of solitude, but still, as you say, being um, comfortable in uh, with your own music and your own art, uh, not necessarily mm. having to be... Um, what you say? Disguised or <laughs> melt, uh, meshed in with a lot of other voices. Um, yes yeah and it i think that's it's a moment in time as well i i'll move on to something else next for sure that's very different i think and i'd actually really like to be produced for the next project that i do to to, it to be in total contrast for from that um and perhaps go back to doing more compositions and um, more slightly more arranged music, mm. but have somebody else have a a large input in the in the sound and the and the production because uh, I think a lot of the recordings I've done they've been very live. It's very much like book somewhere, book a space, do it for four or five days, and then it's mixed and then it's mastered. Mm. But 
I, I have a hankering at the moment for doing something over a longer period of time mm. and being able to reflect on those recordings and then the next time add some more and, and make more of a produced album. Yeah. Um, because I've I've never worked like that on my own music. It's always been fairly live. So mm. that's definitely the next step, I'd say. Yeah, yeah I, I, I had the um, uh, Newfoundland folk singer Matthew Byrne on, on the show a couple of weeks back. Oh, um, I I met him in Cape Breton. Oh, really? Nice. A few years ago. Oh, he's he's yeah. a great guy. <laughs> um, but we spoke about the the whole thing of working with a producer and uh, and how important it is to find the right person if you're gonna collaborate in mm-hmm. that way, because like the right person yeah. that really gets your vision can kind of elevate the thing to uh, somewhere you might have you might not have been able to imagine yourself. But the wrong person can just totally destroy everything. <laughs> So yes. so it's so yeah. important to find these uh, uh, pers- uh people to really that you can really trust with like artistic uh, decisions like this. Yeah, massively and especially when we're I mean, I speak only for myself here, but I can imagine you might be a little similar like we're we're natural control freaks as oh, self- yeah, for sure. self-employed musicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's it's giving away a little bit of that to to somebody and allowing allowing that other voice in um but again yeah i feel like i'm at that stage of life where i've i've said quite a lot of what i (laughs) i want to Mm. say and um there's 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 space for for others input for sure cool nice so um i'm not going to keep you uh the whole day but um (laughs) i usually ask people how they have dealt with this last four to six months or since March, effectively. Um, Like, how have you been handling the whole COVID situations? I mean, you knew that you had an album in the the pipes. So I'm sure that kind of messed up your plans a little bit about the the release of that. Well, it did and it didn't. I I was thinking on this yesterday. I feel very lucky that I did have it Mm -hmm. because I think if I hadn't had that thing or say I hadn't started recording it um I I don't think I would have got it done in this time um you know I mean it it actually would have been probably quite practical and and still legal and and we would have maybe been able to go and do that over these months but but creatively and just headspace wise I don't think I could have could done that during the period so i've felt really fortunate that this was kind of under my belt and it's been something that on days where you don't feel that creative to to go and play or to do a new thing or to write it it, the album's there to do a bit of promotion around or you know the the non-creative parts of it have have kind of helped me ticking along but um yeah, it's it's a very strange time, and I think what's got me through is all my pupils. I do a lot of teaching, mm. and which is usually I go around their houses because I quite enjoy getting out of my home yeah. and mm. leaving my space and being in 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 the surroundings of lots of different families. And I've massively missed that, but being able to still connect with them. So has, it's all on all amazing. online these days, yeah. It's all online and it was looking like it was going to go back to being not, mm. uh, you know, being back to face to face. But yeah, we've gone a little bit backwards in Scotland in the last few okay, weeks. Yeah. So well. so we're we're sticking online. But yeah, so fortunate to have that as, I mean, thank goodness for the internet and just being oh, able yeah. to have all these connections and, yeah. and to make connections through music. I think folk are, definitely when the album came out, people were much more in touch and buying things mm. and just connecting i suppose people have more time to be online and to be present um so feel fortunate for that and we just we've just got to see where it, where it goes but we'll we'll adapt somehow but i hope that we don't have to adapt too much yeah. in a sense of that we can still keep our 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 identities in in, in what we all love doing mm. and like play concerts for people that are actually in the same room yeah uh, <laughs> yeah to real people <laughs> it's crazy to think that it's been six months or something at this point i know yeah uh, I it know. feels like and 
like 10 years almost but it feels like there was a different time before march it does and it, it's so unusual i don't know it's so unusual to be at home for such a stretch of time mm. it's I've just been trying to be really positive about all the all the great things. Yeah, like, which is really important, I think, because th yeah, you just yeah, have to keep the keep the focus on what's what's working or what's good. Totally, and to find the things that really make you tick. Like there's this there's this tree that's on my walk locally that I've noticed it changed throughout the year, and you know it probably changed in the same way last year. But I was far too busy running around the country to to even notice it existed, but daily you see these little changes and and that awareness of your surroundings is is totally invaluable i think so i'm 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 really fortunate for this time um what it's what it's afforded us in in lots of ways and i'm i'm trying to stay focused on that and the positives great that felt like a positive note to end on <laughs> it's good <laughs> advice anyway for anyone struggling with uh these strange times um, yeah, absolutely. So really happy that that you came on and 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 uh, wanted to talk about your album. Um, like, if people want to learn more about you or your album, um, where should they? Where do you want to send them? They can go to the website laurenmccall.co.uk and it's M A C C O L L McCall. Um, and there's a there's an essay there actually, as well as collaborating with the artist. Uh, I asked my friend Mary McFadden to write an essay about the album. She's a um, ethnologist and wrote some lovely words about the the album and its kind of context within within the Highlands. So um, that's there to read too right. and find out a little bit more about the music. And and it's available on CD as well if if people want to order it. It is, yeah, the good old fashioned CD, and the the post box is right next to my house, so I'm I'm always there yeah, right. every <laughs> every day. There you go. <laughs> okay, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, I hope to be able to meet you in out in the real world at some point, and maybe even have a tune. Yeah, you too. <laughs> All right, take care. Yeah, it's been great. Cheers. Thanks, Anders. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Folk Music Podcast. As usual, you can find additional information on the show website at thefolkmusicpodcast.com. You can also follow the show on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and you can watch the show on YouTube. There you go. <laughs> so I'm going to head inside now before I get too cold, but I'll see you next week for another episode of the Folk Music Podcast. Take care. <laughs>